Um, it's really just lovely to see everybody and we're in for another time of ministry. Uh, it's a great privilege to have Charles Douglas back with us <coughs> uh, and his ministry is really something spectacular. And God's going to work tonight and that's, that's absolutely amazing. But before we open God's word, um, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray. <coughs> Gracious God and Father, we thank you for this day, your day. <clears throat> we thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the flowers. Thank you for the things that grow. Thank you, Father, for the, the run-up here today. And we just pray that as we open up your word tonight, that you will show us a new thing. We just pray for Charles as he brings his, your word to us. We just ask, Father, that you will give him freedom of speech. Uh, that you will just fill his heart. Uh, and that you will give him the words that he has to say. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, can I say thank you all for coming out to uh, allow me to shout at you tonight again. And uh, you're very courageous and you're very brave, so thank you very much for taking the time and trouble to come out to hear me. Uh, now, you can, where you're sitting, if you, I say anything that you don't like, you can say it to the person next door and it will not bother me. And the reason it will not bother me is I've left my hearing aids at home. <laughs> so I can't even hear myself tonight, never mind anyone else. But uh, that said, I was to try to endeavour to speak on the men of Issachar who understood the times in which they lived. That was my, my thought for this evening and my message for this evening. Now I don't know if it's by divine intervention or by the mischievous act of the enemy or simply through my own carelessness or through my wife's tidying up but I've lost the notes. <laughs> so we're having a different message this evening. And uh, this evening, I want to give some thoughts on the subject of the Valley of Accor. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Joshua and to chapter 6 of the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 6. And if you would like to keep your Bibles open at chapter 6 and... Uh, chapter 7 this evening, it will make it easier for you to follow me in some of the things that uh, I will be endeavouring to say to you. The Valley of Accor, uh, reading from chapter 6 and reading from verses seven and, uh, 17 and 18. Now, in chapter 6, what you have is you're going to have the battle for and the victory of the Israelites over Jericho. And uh, before they take the city, God gives them some very clear instructions. And those instructions are found in, chap in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 6. And the words are recorded here. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, keep yourselves from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Now when God was saying there was says this, everything is going to be destroyed in Jericho. But it's an act of complete giving over to the Lord, devoting all to the Lord, giving everything to him, taking nothing from the Canaanites who were 
absolutely steeped and saturated with the most abominable sins that you could think of. But everything had to be destroyed and given wholly, irrevocably to the Lord. They were, the Israelites were not even to take anything, not one simple little thing. So God, in those two verses, gives them very clear and specific instructions. And of course, the lesson from those two verses is this. Stay free from pagan things that can and will pollute you. Now, as our society becomes more secularized, it becomes more paganized. And so we have to make sure that we're listening to God and for God to tell us, don't touch this, don't go there, and don't pick up anything from this pagan society. That's the basic lesson of these two verses, 17 and 18. Continuing to read verse 21. And they, that's the Israelites, utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. Now here we have a very strong and severe measure. So why was God so severe in saying, I want you to destroy everything? Well, it was to prevent the pagan Canaanite culture and worship from infecting God's people. Now you and I kind of begin to imagine the horrible things that these Canaanites did and the people of the land as Israel was moving into the land. I had a horrible and despicable thing the, 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 this week on the news. Uh, a politician had been being accused and uh, some pedophile had accused him that this politician had sexually assaulted a boy and tortured him and then killed him. Now, can you imagine that? Now, that's only one man's accusation against this politician. It's only an accusation. But it paints a picture in your mind of what is happening that we are not aware of. And thank goodness that we're not aware of many of these things. But there are things going on in our society which people are going into sin of the most degrading kind and seeming to get away with it, all behind locked doors, and we truly are moving into a pagan society. And that would easily contaminate, and eventually it will contaminate the whole of society. And it's only because the Church of Jesus Christ is salt and light within the midst of the society that the corruption doesn't spread the way that the enemy of your soul and my soul would have it spread. And so it was a very strong, severe measure, but it was to prevent the Canaanite society and culture and worship from infecting God's people. Now in verse 18 it says, Make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Now we're going to read a little bit bigger portion from God's word in chapter 7 of uh, Joshua. Chapter 7 of Joshua and reading from verse 11, reading from verse 11. Now, the Israelites have just come from a victory. And now, they're in defeat. So they've come out of their victorious situation and they've come right into defeat. Now, that can happen to us. You read the story of uh, Samson where he slays the Philistines. And he slays the Philistines, a thousand of the Philistines. And then right after that, he is almost dying of thirst. And it looks like his life's going to be, you know, wiped out. And he does so many things. And he cries to God and God opens up a spring from in a rocky place. Meaning that in the hardest of places, God can supply our need. So Israel has come from victory into defeat and God has got to rectify the situation because they can't. And reading from verse 11, we read these words. 
before that, because of experienced defeat in verses 7 through to 9, Joshua is praying, and he's praying very hard to God. God, why are we in defeat? Why has your people turned their back on the enemy? Why have they run away? And he's pleading with God, and he's seeking God. And coming to verse 11, God begins to speak to him, and he says these words. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant. Now, when you transgress, you overstep the mark. That's what transgression means, just simply overstepping the mark. So we've got to be very careful in our Christian walk in these days in which we live. Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. That's the, what he commanded them was in verses 17 and 18 of chapter 6, which I have uh, commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Get up. This is God speaking to Joshua because he was lying on his face before God. Get up, sanctify the people, set the people apart, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accosted thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you, you take away the accosted thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought forth according to your tribes, twelve tribes. And it shall be that the tribe which the Lord sh takes shall come according to their families. Now, what happened was this. All the tribes would come before them. And then God would say, right, this tribe. Now, how God communicated this tribe and then this family, and then the, this individual, is not stated. But it may have been by lot. God made the decision by lot. That is a possible way. It could be by the Aram and the Thummim, uh, which was on the breastplate of the high priest. Uh, it could have been in that way. But we're not told exactly how God spoke to them but in some way and in some measure, God made it plain which tribe, which household, and then eventually which individual. And so get up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is a cursed thing in your midst, O Israel, you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the cursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes shall be according to families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come by households, and the households which the Lord takes shall come man by man. Then it shall be that he who has taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning, brought, the, uh, brought Israel by their tribes, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the clan of Judah, and took the family of the Zarahites, and he brought the family of the Zarahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. Then he brought his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, uh, the son of uh, Zab, Zabdi, the son of Zerah, uh, the, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. So it started with the tribes, started with the households, started with the individuals that are coming down until God pointed out exactly who the individual was. Then he brought his household man by man. As we read in verse 18, so Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you, give the glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him 
and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. When I saw among the small spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there was hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took them from the midst of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters. You see, when we sin, it affects others. It has a wider circle. It's not just us sinning. It affects everyone round about us. That's what we've got to remember. And when there's sin in the camp, it affects the whole camp. That's why God has to root it out. His oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all he had, they were brought them to the valley of Accor. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned him with fire after they had stoned him with stones. Then they raised over him a great heap of stones, still here to this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Now, we hear a lot about the love of God. We hear a lot about the grace of God and the mercy of God, and thank God for all of those things. But we've got to keep in balance the goodness and the severity of God. You've got to keep that in balance. As too many people are all wishy-washy, mushy sentimentality concerning God and the love of God. See, whom the Lord loves, he chastises. So we've got to keep in balance the goodness and the severity of God. I'm reading the last part of the 26th verse. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, therefore, and came to that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. So we see that the camp of Israel was cursed and troubled. Now, as we've read that passage there, what we have is two things. In verse 11, you have God's indictment. Israel has sinned. You see, one man in Israel sinned, but God looked upon about the whole situation. Israel has sinned. You see, if you or I, who have fellowship here, and we do a blatant sin, the world will not say, oh, they've sinned. Phew, look what they get up to in that church. That's what they'll say. And they'll count the whole church. I'm Christians, hypocrites, you know. They bring, the, they bring everyone in. You know that and I know that. So that's why God's got to deal with these things. So in verse 11, you have God's indictment, uh, indictment, Israel has sinned. Then in verse 13, you have God's requirements. Take away the accursed thing. That thing that was irrevocably uh, devoted to the Lord for destruction in uh, Jericho. Now, what is the meaning of Achor? Well, verse 25. Why hast thou troubled Accord us? The Lord shall trouble Achor thee. So Achor means trouble. Trouble brings three things. It brings disturbance, it brings distress, and it brings defeat. The troubler, troubler in verse 1 of chapter 7 is Achan. Achan shows us the social dimensions of an individual's action when that man sins in the midst of God's people. One man 
brought defeat upon the whole nation of Israel. One person can bring shame and distress and defeat upon a whole congregation. We understand these things. But as long as we're aware of them and as long as we're prepared to protect the work of God, then God will aid us and help us in these things. So what is the lesson here? You see, we have to deal with trouble quickly as possible or greater trouble will follow. That's the way it happens. Now question, what are we to do with the trouble and the troubler? Well, verse 25 tells us, and we've just read verse 25. <laughs> they stoned them with stones. Now, if someone is in blatant sin and bringing shame and discord and disharmony within the fellowship and ruining the credibility and reputation of the fellowship that we belong to, then we have to take drastic action, but not the same <laughs> drastic action as they took. You don't go out and get a heap of stones, though sometimes you may feel like that, but you don't do that. But we see there how to handle the troublesome situation. In verses 13 to 15, you have the trouble to be removed. In verses 16 through to 18, the, trouble, the troubler has to be discovered. In verses 25 to 26, the troubler is stoned. And being stoned is thereby removed from the congregation of Israel. We all like to see the seats filled in our churches, don't we? But we should never get to the place where we drop our standards. And we should never get to the place where we are frightened to tell someone to go. I had to do that one time. It wasn't easy. But someone brought disrepute upon some of the function of the work of God. And I got the deacons around about me and I said, we must deal with the situation. And there's the only person I really put out the church. And I says, go and don't come back. So you've got to deal with things. And we must never be afraid. We must never be afraid to put people out if they are doing harm to the word of God. In verse 26, we see that the trouble is gone. Now, there have been many things that have troubled the work of God down through the ages. Teachings, practices, personalities. These things bring disturbances and at times they bring defeat to God's people. And we can understand that. And we see that in our technological day more than anything and any time before. You know, people can get on <laughs> YouTube <laughs> and <laughs> they can talk the most awfulest rubbish. Oh, I get myself into a hole here that I'm digging the deeper as I'm going on. <laughs> but you understand what I mean. You know, you get all these prosperity preachers, you get all these people with extreme views, and they all come on uh, what they call the God channels, and they all put forward their things. People sitting there, oh, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? And they're being conned right, left, and center <laughs> down, through, down through what is being conveyed to them. And it's the same with YouTube. You've got to be very selective what you listen to and who you listen to. You still like me, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but teachings and practices and personalities abound today because of our technology of which we have in this day and this generation. And as I said, they can disturb people, and at times they can bring God's people into defeat. Now, unfortunately, this will increase in these closing days of grace. And we talk about these closing days of grace. Now, the enemy of your soul and my soul, Satan, knows that his time is short. And he's pulling out all the stops to harm, destroy, and frustrate the work of God and to harm the people of God. Now, in this day of grace, and this closing day of grace, 
The enemy will make sure that grace will be abused. Now, how can the enemy abuse grace? How can he possibly do that? By bringing in a flood time of what I would, could call cheap grace. Cheap grace. Now, what is cheap grace? Cheap grace makes excuses. You know something's wrong. You know someone has done something terribly wrong. You can say, oh, well, they made a wee mistake. No, they did something really wrong. Oh, they made a wee mistake. That's cheap grace. We cover things up. Oh, well, we'll let it lie. Well, God will deal with that. We'll just we'll put it to the side. No, that, we don't want to offend anyone. We don't want to harm anyone. That's cheap grace. Peace at any price. That's cheap grace. Cheap grace sounds marvelously spiritual. Or we'll overlook people's faults and failings because I myself have faults and failings. Well, we realize our own faults and failings. That's true. But I hope we're mature enough to try and do something about it. But cheap grace. And the enemy will come and he will exploit God's grace by a flood type of cheap grace coming into the church. And we drop our standards, and we don't handle things we should handle, and we don't deal with situations and personalities the way we should, because cheap grace sounds wonderfully spiritual. But by it, the church will be more subtly deceived and be putting on a beautiful Babylonian garment. And we'll deal with the Babylonian garment further along. Now in Matthew 7, in verse 15, we read these words. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Subtlety. They look harmless. And boy, I've had some people come into uh, churches, uh, the church that I've pastored for many years, and they looked harmless, and they sounded harmless, and they looked great, but oh boy... <laughs> They created some problems as time went on. Subtlety, they look harmless, but oh, they can really hurt uh, God's people. They look harmless, and people think, oh, they're just part of the flock of God. They're part of us. They speak the right words. For a little while, they behave in the right manners. They seem to be wonderful people. They help in the church. Oh, how did we get along with, without them, and so on and so forth. But they come in subtly. But inwardly, it says, they are ravenous wolves. And this tells us the damage that they can do to God's flock. How? Principally, by their doctrines and, of course, by their behavior. Beware. The word be there literally means Hold your minds away from. So when you're getting a lot of false doctrine being bombarded to you from all the technology and all the wide spectrum of speakers that are bombarding our minds today, be aware, hold your mind away from that. From who? Hold, who do we hold our mind away from? From who? False prophets, 2 Corinthians 11. False brothers, 2 Corinthians 11. False teachers, 2 Peter 2. False witnesses, 1 Corinthians 15. False Christ, Matthew 24. They're all there. Now all of these things have been in the church down through its history. But more and more in these days as they lead up to the Lord's coming. And thereby making the valley of Accor for many, for many people. Now let us just ask ourselves two questions. A, what makes a false prophet? And B, what is the satanic strategy behind them? What makes a false prophet? And B, what is the satanic strategy behind the false prophets? Well, first of all, let's take a little look at a true prophet. A true prophet is God's mouthpiece. He speaks as the oracles of God. And when a, fall, when a true prophet speaks, it not only impacts your mind, but it impacts your heart. 
and he's speaking the oracles of God, and the, oh, there's a response to that. You feel you've got something in God, you go away with something in God. The Old Testament prophets, what was the, the main thrust of their ministry? Well, the main thrust of their ministry was to proclaim the standard of God's covenant in all its commandments and in all its precepts and in all its statutes. That was the main thrust of the Old Testament prophet's ministry. Now, prediction, there was there. But prediction was there in the prophetic utterances to a lesser extent though that extent was very significant. A false prophet believes totally and he is absolutely convinced that he is proclaiming God's truth and he can and does speak with sincerity and so he captures the ears of the people. I remember hearing about uh, a Christian years ago, and uh, they uh, were starting out and they were looking for a job and they were going to get a job as a salesman. And they were, the company was interviewing them and uh, the company was saying, well, what makes you think you can be a good salesman for us? He says, and he's, the reply was, well, is your product a good product? Of course, the manufacturer will say, yes, yes, it's a good product. It says, what will make me a good salesman is that I must believe in your product 100%. If I am convinced that your product is the best product on the market and I believe that with all of my heart, that's what will make me sell your product. Conviction. Belief that you have the best. Believe that this is the best in the market. Well, a false prophet comes and they are totally convinced. They believe that they are giving people God's word. They don't say, oh, my mind is filled with lies. My mind is filled with deceit. My heart is leading people astray. No. They'll come up and they'll use phrases, God has shown me. As I was waiting on God tonight, God gave me this word for you. They will use phrases like that. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. They will use phrases like that, and they will believe it 100%. Now, whatever whispered into their minds and their hearts may have come from a different source, but they were totally convinced it was the voice of God, and they go forward and they propagate that message and they are totally convinced that it's right. And therefore, they sold the message. People believe it. It comes over with conviction. And that's how he begins to capture the ears of people. You see, the, he speaks sincerely of his message. <laughs> Reminds me of Huey Greed. <laughs> he used to say again and again his TV. Oh boy, I give away my age. <laughs> He used to say again and again, you know, really sincerely, folks. <laughs> I don't know how many times he used to say that on the television program, sincerely, folks. It got so sincere that you didn't believe, <laughs> believe in sincerity. But this is how the false prophets capture the ears of the people. You see, sincerity is not the hallmark by which we judge what is said. Because a person can be sincerely wrong. This is the hallmark by which we judge what is being said. A false prophet can convey in his message a measure of truth. There will be that there. Half-truth, that will be there. And non-truth will also be in all of the same message. Question. Why do they have a platform? Well, Isaiah 30, verse 10, gives us a little insight why they have a platform. Now, this is people in Isaiah 30, verse 10, speaking, as it were, to the prophets of that day. And this is what they're saying. Say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, 
prophesy not to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. That's what it says in verse 10 of Isaiah 30. You see, people prefer to hear false assurances and smooth things are easier to swallow. Now in 2 Chronicles in chapter 18, you have there two kings, Jehoshaphat and Ahab. And Jehoshaphat was a reasonably good king. And Ahab uh, was not a good king. You know, behind every good man, there is a good woman. Is that right? I'm trying to win half the congregation here. <laughs> well, behind every bad man, there's a Lulu of a woman. <laughs> there really is a... And, and Jezebel was a real bitch. She really was. <laughs> uh, Abraham's wife. Uh, Ahab's wife. And we read of Jehoshaphat and Ahab. And, of course, they're connected by marriage. What should you get linked up with? And there are many lessons in this passage, but uh, time will not allow us to go down. But anyway, Jehoshaphat comes and he visits Ahab and they put on a big do. Oh, they kill a lot of sheep and goats and they have a real good party and a big meal. So in the middle of this meal, Ahab says to Jehoshaphat, uh, wait, will you join me in coming to Ramoth Gilead? You know, I want to make war on them. Will you join with me? Oh, absolutely, I'm with you, body and soul. I want my people or your people. We'll join you in this war. No problem whatsoever. It says, but uh, after he made that commitment, he then says to Ahab what he should have said at the beginning before he made the commitment. He says, is there any word from the Lord? <laughs> that we should have said that before he made his commitment. But he made his commitment, then he asks. It's like me sometimes. <laughs> we do those. But... Uh, what happens is this. So they get 400 prophets of Baal. They come and they start prophesying. Oh, and boy, they're telling about a marvelous and glorious victory. They're telling how it will be wonderful. The enemy will run from you. The, the sight of you just coming over the brow of the hill, they'll take off. You will have a marvelous victory. And of course, it's triumphalism, triumphalism, triumphalism coming from the mouth of 400 prophets for they were prophesying, thus saying, go up to Rimmel Gilead and be victorious. Triumphalism in the face of stark reality. What was the stark reality? It was this. Now Ahab had brought in Baal worship through Jezebel, built a house to Baal, a temple to Baal, led the people astray, they did all of those terrible things. And God says, right, we'll deal with him. But how will we deal with him? And you read it in chapter 18. When you go home, read 2 Chronicles 18. And a spirit comes before God. And it says, I, I know how to, how to get him. I know how to trip him up. I know how to defeat him. I wonder how you're going to do that. Well, what I'll do with this, I'll go and I'll put a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. You see, everybody that prophesies is not always motivated or unctionized by the Holy Spirit. And so God allows this spirit, this demonic spirit, this lying spirit, to fill the mouths and minds of these 400 prophets and convince Ahab that he's going to be victorious. When you read further down, you find that there is one true prophet of God who tells the, the others that they're all lying. You see, falsehood abounds today. Lying spirits are abroad today. Now in Numbers 23, 19, it says this, God is not man that he should lie. Now we all agree with that. Now when people reject God's truth and give in to falsehood, 
then it's as if God is saying, all right, that's what you want. That's what you want. That's what you want to hear. Then God will allow a lying spirit, which was a demon, to deceive the prophets, deceive people. That's what you want. You go and do it. Homosexuality used to be hidden, didn't it? It wasn't blatant. What do you have now? Pride marches. God says to society, that's what you want. You have it. It will destroy your individual lives and it will destroy your nations, but that's what you want. And they can march in their thousands, they can march in their tens of thousands, but God has given them over to a strong delusion. Now that's not an original thought with me. I heard that from someone else, and I agree with it. Second question. What is the satanic strategy behind the false prophesying? Now, when you read Revelation 13, there are two beasts there. And beasts gives you an insight into their character. We can maybe deal with that sometime down the road if God spares us and we have the opportunity to deal with Revelation 13. So the first beast in chapter 13 of Revelation, first beast is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist comes out of the sea. Now, in using symbolic language uh, in Revelation, the sea speaks of the restlessness, the revolution, the confusion of the nations, the international trouble in the world. And what happens? The Antichrist arises from that. And he says, I have the answer to these problems. I can get you on the right track again. You see, it was out of the confusion of the Weimar Republic in Germany in the 1920s that Hitler arose. It was in the confusion of the revolutions in Russia that were taking place after, after World War I, uh, just at the tail end of World War I and afterwards, and the communist revolution had taken place that uh, Lenin arose and then ultimately Stalin arose. It was out of the civil war and confusion in China that Mao Zedong arose. And so when things get troublesome and when things get chaotic in the world, let's keep our eyes and our ears open to see who rises up. Because the Antichrist will rise from the restlessness of the nations. Now his object in arising is to bring a false peace, bring a false new age, and bring a false new order because he wants to present himself as the false Christ. Now the second beast is a false prophet and he is from the earth, something that is established. Religions all over the world are an established reality, but they have a form of religion but denying the power thereof. Power. What is the power that they are denying? Power. Well, the power there means the present effective working of God in and through true, and I emphasize the word true, true believers' lives. A true believer is one who has accepted and confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. A true believer they have the Holy Spirit in their lives helping them to conform to the image of Christ. True believers endeavor to line up their lives in according with God's word, the Bible. That's the evidences of true believers. And so the second, the false prophet, arises and builds upon a form of religion which denies the power thereof. I'd love to go into more detail with that, but it's impossible this evening. And so the second beast we see in that portion of scripture has two horns like a lamb, but speech like a dragon, like a lamb. 
a diabolical imitation of Jesus, the Lamb of God. Speech like a dragon. How does a dragon speech? 2 Corinthians 11, we have Paul's words. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. A dragon speaks to beguile with words as smooth as butter and as soothing as oil. Easy to swallow. Back to Joshua chapter 7. A troubler troubled them and brought Israel into defeat. The valley of Achor. And Achor means trouble. Now, Achan's sin is confessed in Joshua chapter 7 verse 21. I saw, I coveted, I took. That's the exact same thing that happened in Genesis 6, 3 and 6. Eve with the fall. She saw, she coveted, she took. Same thing. You see, the devil's strategy never changes. He's got no bright new ideas. He tempts us the same way. <laughs> and it works in every generation. <laughs> As awakened, saw, he coveted and he took. And the first thing there that got his eye that uh, he got his eye on, or rather, which caught his eye. So he's in the midst of uh, Jericho, and they're burning things, and they're destroying things, they're giving things over, and whoa. Look at that. That's beautiful. That, 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 that's gorgeous. That's a, that's a shame to burn that. Got his eye. What was it? A Babylonian garment. And it, that Babylon garment must have been a real beautiful thing. There's a lesson there for us. Babylon has the power to attract. And remember, Babylon captured God's people and took them into Babylon. Babylon destroyed God's house in Jerusalem. Babylon was an enemy of God's people. But Babylon has the power to attract the Babylonian garment. The Babylonian garment is being waved in front of churches today. Do things this way and I'll fill your church. Take this method that I'm showing you and I'll fill your church. The Babylonian garment is being waved. Babylon has the power to attract. The Babylonian spirit seeks to dominate, to manipulate, and to control. That's basically what witchcraft is. Now the first step into the valley of Akor, trouble, is the desire to wear the garment of Babylon. In Revelation 17, we have ecclesiastical Babylon. In Revelation 18, we have political Babylon, and we have financial Babylon. And we can see these things shaping up and increasing in momentum in our day, because why? Babylon is rising again. What is the message that God gives us in these days? Come out of her, my people, and do not partake of her sins. Now many a church and even a movement or denomination have experienced a valley of Accor when the political religious mind has come into play. And when we create an organization, and the church was never meant to be an organization, it was meant to be a living organism. That's the difference. But when we create an organization that encourages a religious political mindset, no matter how much biblical and spiritual phraseology is used, it will bring you into the valley of Accor. You see, Jesus Christ is not, I emphasize, Jesus Christ is not a constitutional monarch. 
He is the Lord of the church. He is the head of the church. He is not a constitutional monarch. And we can see his headship and his lordship of his church in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 as he's dealing with the churches in those portions of scripture. Now, relax. <laughs> it's not all gloom and doom. And Hugh is just wiping his brow there. <laughs> so thank goodness for that. <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom. Isaiah 65 and verse 10, it says these words, Sharing shall become a pasture for flocks, and the valley of Accor, a place for hares to lie down, for my people who have sought me. The context of verse 10 is God's remnant. Now the doctrine of the remnant is an important one. And provided that it is studied and taught in a balanced way so that it does not produce a sense of exclusiveness, it should be borne in mind that in these closing days of time, as we see a remnant in the closing days of Judah, so we will see a remnant in the closing days of the church in these last days. And we will see it again as the strategy of the secular human government gets really into top gear and the political religious mindset begins to affect the church. Now we see a remnant in Thyatira in Revelation 2.29. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, this is what it says in verse 29, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. The deep things of Satan. What is that? Deceptive promises. Secret spiritual knowledge. Now there are many things creeping into the church and into the lives of God's people today that have their roots in Eastern religions. One example. I can give a few, but one example. Well, maybe... Yoga classes now in churches. That's an alternative spirituality. It's not just exercises. Contemplative prayer, the emptying of the mind. That's Eastern. That's what the yogis do in India. There's many things creeping in, and we're swallowing it hook, like and sinker. Oh, but we get a good crowd with the yoga classes. Wow, we really do, you know. And we've got a woman comes along and she, she massages your head, and it's great. <laughs> yeah, a bit fun, but unfortunately it's real, it's true, it's creeping into churches. What are we to do? It's okay, I, I haven't filled the whole book. <laughs> Revelation 3, 2 says this, and it's talking about the church at Sardis. And it says this, Jesus says this, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. Wake up. Well, the question is, wake up from what? Complacency. Complacency in an individual's life and in the life of a church is a spiritual disease. What should they strengthen? They should strengthen their love for Jesus, their faithfulness to the things of God, persevering in their going on in the Christian life. They're keeping Christ's words by sound doctrine. And it says, strengthen the things that remain and are about to die. So in Sardis, the situation was dire. It was about to die. It was a dire situation, but not totally helpless. Jesus was stepping in at the very last moment of this dire situation and says, wake up, strengthen the things that remain and is about to die. But they had to make decipher's action had to be taken or else spiritual death would follow. Now in these days of rampant 
and moral behavior, let us pursue the holiness that flows from grace. Be you holy, for I am holy. And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. When we respond to God, he says this. When we really come and respond to God and say, I'm sorry. I really want to do things your way. When we respond to God, he says this. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to do you good and not to do you harm. You see, Achan's plans were selfish plans. Isaiah 65 and 10 a man can bring us into the valley of trouble, but God can bring us into a valley of rest. The valley of Acre was a resting place for herds, for the people who seek me. It was the same geographical situation. And when things go wrong in the church and disaster has taken place through uh, harm and it caused harm to the church through actions and words that have been spoken, and people are left in the same geographical situation, God can move in the same geographical situation as he moved in the Valley of Achor. It was for Achan and Israel a valley of trouble, but it would be a place of resting place for herds. Same geographical situation. God can change here. The same geographical position of this fellowship and this church, he can change it. And when God moves, when you move from the valley of trouble to a valley of tranquility, Hosea 2.15 says this, which speaks of the Lord's mercy. And there I will give her, her vineyards, and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. A door of hope. A hope that will not make a shame. A hope that is not a disappointment. No matter how painful your experience in your personal valley of Acre has been, the Lord can take that negative experience and open a door of hope, even in Acre. Joshua 15 and 7. We find there the valley of Acre as a boundary for Judah. Speaking, of course, of separation. A boundary tells us that when we're moving out of one country and moving into a different country, this is the end of this country, this is the beginning of this country. This puts me in mind of a little place on the borders, Coldstream. Everybody know Coldstream? Yeah, we know Coldstream. <coughs> one end of the bridge, you have Coldstream in Scotland. You cross the bridge, you have Corn Hill in England, in Northumberland. Tweed in the middle. But it's a boundary. It's an unmistakable boundary. In 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 to 18, we have Paul's appeal for separation. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Baal? Be la el. I can never say that word. Belial <laughs> is about the closer I get to it. What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? God has set boundaries for his people. Not to hinder us, but to keep us safe. Let us not go out of the boundaries of our tribe. Let us stay within the boundaries of our tribe. The Babylonian garment caught Achan's eye and filled his eye to seek more the silver and the gold. That was the beginning but then the silver, and then the gold. Oh, Babylon, Babylon, let me not be enticed with thy beautiful robes. Accor, a valley of trouble, yes. A place of rest, a door of hope, a boundary of separation. When Accor is a place of rest, a door of hope, and a boundary of separation, then let us know that we have arrived there by the good graces of our God. O oh God, turn our disturbances 
into a season of delights. Amen. Well, that was a tonic, if ever it was. <clears throat> and I can just see the, some of the fellowship just looking, saying, how come he can't he preach like that? <laughs> <laughs> The Word of God never changes. Seasons change, people change, situations change. But the Word of the Lord never changes. Let's just bring this whole evening to a close. Let's pray together. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for what we've heard from your Word tonight. Thank you, Father, that your Word never changes. It's quick, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And help us, Father, just to get back to basics and just get back to reading to show us what you have for us. We just ask now that you will just part us with your richest blessing for everything we ask is in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. For more information about Moriel, check out our website, www.moriel.org.